For those of you who weren't there yesterday, uh, just to give you a, a bit of background, one of the things that uh, we, we were all, I think uh, the youngest there is 19. The oldest there is 20 and a half. Um, so we were, we were quite young. And people ask, often asked, how did you imagine this? What was this about? And, um, and so the position basically was that um, we, we, were, we had a black power movement operating in Australia for about 18 months. And of course, we were like-minded people from different tribes, different nations, uh, all gathered in Sydney. We're all fresh out of high school. Um, some of us were starting university. I had started a degree in uh, economics commerce at Sydney University. One of the things that uh, we did, we, were, we had a common objective, and that was the land was stolen from our people, and this country was, they were living on it, and they massacred, there, there was massacre sites all over this country. For those of you, and thanks to Professor um, Gary Lilienthal, who's going to be presenting here today, he reminded me of a story about Antigone. And so I, I had a look at that story, and it's about the hatred of a people of, and, and how they just totally disrespect and have no association with people at all. And that's what happened to you with the British settlers. And I, I'm reminded of a story um, back home where my ancestors on our country, the Iwaliai, where um, there was a big ceremony taking place. And when we have ceremony, the people divide. The men go one way, the women go the other, and they meet later. One of the things that happened was I, I read this 1889 interview with a man called Con Bride, who orchestrated the massacre at Hospital Creek, north east of Rewarana. And what he said was that um, he'd asked the people to leave because he got sick and tired of seeing spears in the side of the cattle and in the side of the sheep. How can you come and ask a people who's occupied country for over 60, 70,000 years, 100,000 years, to say, I'm sorry, but you, you have to move away now because we're here, we're going to put cattle and sheep here? It just makes no sense. However, and so the people didn't move. And he orchestrated a posse, and he went out and he killed quite a lot of people. We have no idea how many people were killed, but we do know that there were a group called Barambinja, Yualiai, Murawari, and Ngimba. And these people are all dead in one place at this hospital creek. I took an expert in human physiology, uh, and, he's a, um, and I asked him to come and identify human bones. He's a specialist in that. He came from Western Australia to help me. And an old, um, one of the Ngimbar elders, sort of we got in the car and we drove out to have a look. And we walked around looking at the bones. And we were picking up bones and trying to distinguish between the human bone and animal bones. And uh, so he was picking up bones and saying, this is a human bone. No, that's an animal bone, that's an animal bone, but this is a human bone here. So we actually found this location. I met with the Governor General here, this bloke here, when he was the Governor of New South Wales. I met him in 2015 in Sydney. And I asked him, when I met at the, at the Government House, I asked him, I said, can you please um, make arrangements uh, to help us bury our dead? And then we might talk reconciliation to you, but until that happens, nothing's going to happen. We will not talk to you about reconciliation because we've got nothing to reconcile. But you're the murderers, and you condone that. And so uh, he, he said, well, I'll talk to the New South Wales government and find out if they will assist and work with you uh, to locate the people so you can bury your dead. Now, the reason I tell you that is because, you see, 
When we put that up, that was about land rights. The McMahon government said they were going to lease land to Aborigines. That was their national policy. And that wasn't going to work. And so we decided that, no, we're going to confront these people, and we're going to confront them the best way possible. But the question was, do you go violent? Do you go diplomatic? Or do you work out another, another methodology? And so this here came by action. We didn't come down here with the intention to setting up an embassy. We came down here to set up a permanent vigil, a demonstration. And, um, and so we put this beach umbrella up. That was the only thing we could find. Uh, the plastic there was to cover us because it was raining. And of course, that there basically said um, that we're here and we're here to stay. The next morning at about 7.30 when the sun was up, I remember Commissioner Osborne of the Federal Police and the ACT police came and uh, looked at it and talked to us and said, what are you doing here? We said, we're here to protest about a policy that happened. And um, his question was, how long are you going to be here? We said, until we get land rights. Yeah. And so um, who would have thought that 50 years on, we're still there? Many people, the media and others, talk about uh, the place being an eyesore. It's an eyesore only because it torments the psyche of the white Australians. Every time they see that, they know there's something wrong in this country. And it's a silent vigil that's demonstrating to the people that we haven't gone, we're not going, and you're going to deal with us one way or the other. Yeah. And the day is coming. So 50 years on, I think we're all over talking. Talking is finished. The time now is for action. When we put this up, I'm, I've got to say this. The greatest friends that we had were foreign diplomats because they invited us, almost every embassy in Canberra, invited us, Billy, the guy sitting next to me, I'm in the black, and Billy Craig, he's next door. When they invited us, he and I would go off different evenings and we'd have dinner at the different embassies with the Chargé d'Affaires or the um, First Assistant Secretary um, or the Ambassador, most of the Ambassadors. And they asked us what was it that Aboriginal people were after. And um, we talked about land rights and we talked about the need to decolonise and we talked about the need to get back to England to help us get back to England and commence a dialogue with the Crown of England. Because you see, Australia does not have its own sovereignty. It never has. Because you see, the Crown of England has never had possessory title to this land, never. The King has never set foot here to claim the land as his. No, he sent, he sent governors, he sent other people to this land. And this is what we want to talk about today, is the fact that by their own admissions, and I will, I will show it to you, by their own admissions in their Senate and Constitutional Legal Affairs um, report to the Parliament in 1983, they tabled a report which said that Australia is an occupying power, the Australian governments. And so we now have, and I will talk a little bit more about this, we didn't have a flag, but a flag was created by an Aboriginal person down at Nowra, and so we flew this flag. And the flag symbolised trouble and people sitting around talking trouble. That's what that flag represented that flew on the embassy. One of the things that, um, that we're now looking at, if we're looking at, and this is frightening the Americans, because I know from America, from inside the USA, that America's very worried about Australia flying two, three flags. The first one is they fly the, the Australian flag, they fly the Aboriginal flag, and they fly the Torres Strait Island flag. I will talk more about this later, but under normal circumstances, you would be prosecuted and jailed for treason doing that in most countries. Because what you're doing there, with the symbolism of those flags flying on the parliament, flying on the legals, on their courts, flying on their state parliaments, flying on their municipal buildings like the Shire Councils, 
That's a representation of the fact that there is two laws, three laws in this country, and that is Aboriginal law and custom, Torres Strait Island law and custom, and British law and custom. So the question then is, when you're dealing with Australia, whose law is paramount? And so we will investigate that today as well as we go through uh, the day. And um, we will demonstrate to you how Aboriginal law is the superior law of this nation and these white occupiers that sit up on that hill up there making the law, they are in fact a military junta. They're a, they, uh, they are occupying this country through police and through the military. That's the way they control us. And so we need to talk about that. And so this embassy, um, when we set it up, took on that challenge and started to say, this is how it's going to work and uh, we will challenge you every day of the week, every day of the year, until you come and start talking with us. So people have said now, talk is over. So um, what I will present um, to you now and today is a, um, a way forward and how we can take this challenge uh, to the government. Um, I often say to people that if we're serious about this, our starting point is not in Australia. Our starting point is in England. And I've been to England for the last 37 years now, back and forwards. And I've been to other countries around the world looking at how they've gained independence. And one of the things that, uh, that shocks me is it's so easy. It's very easy. And the Australian public, I think, are sick and tired of the type of government that we've had in this country. You know, you look at this mad adder, the, you know, ScoMo, they call him. Yeah. How can you take that man seriously? Seriously. This man is a fool. And so from us here, we could curse the living daylights out of them. We can talk until the cows come up, but they do not make the final decision. This parliament, the state parliaments, do not make the final decision in this country. The people who make the final decision in this country live in England. And that's where we've got to go. That's where we have to take our fight to. And I will show you some things. Okay, so we have some elders in the room and um, we're starting to, uh, the people are coming. So we do have a long program and um, I'd like to start now. I'd like to acknowledge the Ngambri Ngunnawal people of this land that we're, where we're meeting and um, pay respects to their elders past, present and, and the emerging uh, leaders from those nations. I also acknowledge the elders of this who are in here from other nations like the Kunja, Ngimba, Yualiai um, and other, and Gomoroi. And we need um, to also acknowledge other nations uh, throughout this country. And um, it's, uh, we're looking forward to it. We've, we're having some meetings. We're organising things around the country and I will tell you more about that. We have three, uh, three speakers, myself and Professor Gary Lilienthal and, um, and Alicia, um, who's over there. Um, thank you. Um, and then we're going to have some, um, some lunch at about 12.30, and then we'll go through with a question and answer in the afternoon. So we start off colonial occupying power. Now, as I said, one of the greatest forms of admission against interest is a statement like this. They would never be able to defend this in any court anywhere in the world. But in 1983, the Parliament of Australia um, set up a Senate Standing Committee on Constitution and Legal Affairs to look at how they're going to enter into a treaty or a series of treaty compact or makarata with Aboriginal people going forward. And so they, they did a whole 12 months um, investigation and looking at the different legal mechanisms that would make it possible for them to be able to negotiate treaties with Aboriginal people. I was in England when they, while they were doing this, uh, talking with Ireland and Scotland and Wales. And um, one of the things that I found out over there is looking at the English, um, the union uh, between England, Ireland and Wales and Scotland. Surprisingly enough, yeah, those countries are loosely connected to make up the United Kingdom. And uh, so we looked at how, how that worked. We have a friend in Australia, in, in England, or two friends. One is Margaret Ward, QC, 
and another one, Geoffrey Robinson, QC. And Geoffrey and I, we, we had been going through this stuff in London. And so and then all of a sudden, in 1983, this thing came out in the parliament with an admission. And this is what it says. It may be that a better and more honest appreciation of the facts relating to Aboriginal occupation at the time of the settlement and of the Eurocentric view taken by the occupying powers could lead to the conclusion that sovereignty inerred in the Aboriginal people at that time. And so the question that we ask now and what that embassy was asking was when did we transfer the sovereign rights of the Aboriginal people from at that time to now? There are no documents of session. There are no documents of acquiescence. And there are certainly no documents of a peace settlement as a result of a war being waged against us with the British. I made a submission some time ago in 2014. I went to The Hague and uh, we were putting a submission into the International Court of Justice uh, to raise some questions. And of course, uh, this is a gentleman, the ambassador from Brussels, Belgium ambassador, who was sent to me to talk with me uh, from the United Nations in, in New York. And uh, his name is Ambassador Willie de Buck um, from Brussels. And so this gentleman introduced himself and said, I'm the guy that did all the negotiations and mediated between Kosovo, Serbia, Yugoslavian countries when they had the war. So this gentleman facilitated a lot of the discussions to settle the differences between those nations in Kosovo. And so he had talks with me and he, he had talks with me because the registrar of the ICJ asked him to meet with me as well as the Secretary of the United Nations. We had those talks and he looked at it and he said, Michael, um, I must say to you that the questions that you've asked and that you put up to the ICJ, all of those questions that you ask have been answered. And they've been sent back to the Security Council of the UN and read those statements, read those conclusions and the recommendations and the advice, and you will find the answers that you're seeking as an independent people within your country. He said, the answer's been already made for you. And so he cited the Western Sahara case, the Kosovo case, uh, the wall in Palestine, that is the occupation of, of the Palestinian lands by Israel, Timor-Leste v Australia, in terms of right of self-determination and being independent, and to use your own natural resources, where Portugal was involved in that case, because Portugal was a former colonial power that occupied Timor-Leste. And so he said, when, if you really want to know the answers, he said, they're just going to give you the same answers as what they gave there. Now, when we went there, we asked him about the definition of sovereignty. And so the Western Sahara case. And so if we look at that, the UN General Assembly in uh, 3292 requested an advisory opinion on, was the Western Sahara at the time of colonization by Spain, a territory belonged to no one, terra nullius. And should the majority opinion be no, the following would be addressed. What were the legal ties between this territory and the Kingdom of Morocco and the Mauritian entity? And the ICJ came back and said, the judgment of um, Amun referred to Bayam Bamar, senior president of the Supreme Court of Zaire, the ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and the man who was born there from remains, attract, remains attached thereto and must one day return to the to be reunited with his ancestors. This is the basis of the ownership of the soil or better sovereignty. So in the Western Sahara case, the claim of terra nullius by Spain had to give way to the original sovereignty of the indigenous owners due to the evolving international legal standards. And then the United Nations started working on looking at getting rid of the scourge of colonialism. And so this declaration here by the United Nations, um, and I think you have a copy of it in your, in your paper, uh, Resolution 1514, December 1960, 
and had declared that uh, the subjection of people to an alien subjugation, domination and exploitation constitutes a denial of fundamental human rights, is contrary to the Charter of the United Nations, and is an impediment to the promotion of world peace and cooperation. And two, all peoples have a right to self-determination by, by virtue of the fact that they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their, uh, their economic, social and cultural development. Those last three aspects, economic, social and cultural development, is one of the things that the Australian government works very hard at suppressing in this country. And Aboriginal people, unfortunately, by virtue and by the nature of a militarised regime that's running this country, um, we are suppressed. We cannot use our lands in any way to make money. We cannot do anything to use those lands that we may have as an asset. They deny our ability to do that. And one way they do that is, let's take a typical native title case and a determination that's been made in this country in recent times. In those native title determinations, when you read them, you will see where they give the native title to the people, recognise, yes, this is, these are the traditional owners. Now, when they say that, then you go to the land registry office in New South Wales, West Australia, Northern Territory, or wherever it may be in this country. You go and have a look at the land registry title, and the name of that tribe or nation, who they say it owns native title over that country, their names are not on the registered titles in their land registry. What they have in those registries is an area within their boundary area and is classified as UC, USL. That's what's on the title deeds after native title is determined. So I went and I got with some friends and lawyers and we had a look at what is US, UCL, uh, USL. And the definition is those lands is classified, there are, they are classified as unused state land. So our names are not on those titles. And so that prevents us from making any money or being able to use that for any economic reason. It prevents any economic development whatsoever. The Declaration of Granting Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples adopted by the General Assembly, the same resolution, inadequacy of political, economic, social or educational preparedness should never serve as a pretext for delaying independence. So, we are, many of our nations, we don't have those capacities yet. We're still working on it. We're working hard. And a lot of our elders, they're sick and tired of talking. They want action. They want something to happen. And so it's us, up to us now to show the way and lead the people um, to, uh, to get to uh, where they want to be in terms of being able to take in control and being self-determining in, in this country. The way in which they fund Aboriginal organisations in this country is very clever. They do, they fund Aboriginal organisations and they use it as a tool to split and divide communities. It's very smart. The other thing that they do in this country is that they restrict the type of money that they give you for development. And you have to report back to the government on everything you do. And so there's a very clever controlling mechanism that's associated with the financing of Aboriginal organisations. So, in the 1970s, when we put the embassy up, we had a powerful movement, a very powerful movement of some very smart people, Aboriginal people. This demonstration here, this is part of the demonstration in July 1972. And I put this up because, believe it or not, at that particular time, a lot of our old ones, and especially those ones who are at the front here and we're all laughing, we're laughing because we knew we had these guys backtracked. They were retreating. They were moving backwards. They had no idea how to deal with us, the government. And so what we needed to do, we did not, we did not have any financial resources to maintain that push here in Canberra to take it to the government. And they were trying to avoid us like the plague in having those conversations. And unfortunately, finance crippled us, the lack of finance, the lack of the ability to be able to move forward independently. Had we had supporting finance at that time, 
this country would be very different right now, 50 years on. But they knew how to do it because they put a lot of money into Aboriginal development, but they split us in doing it. So the Kosovo case, let me just return to the Kosovo case. Accordance uh, to the international law, unilateral declaration of independence in respect of Kosovo was based on a humanitarian crisis and a right to be free from tyranny through the UDI, Unilateral Declaration of Independence. In its advisory opinion delivered on the 22nd of July 2010, the ICJ concluded that the Declaration of Independence of Kosovo, adopted on the 17th of February 2008, did not violate international law. And so what we're doing here is that we now have about six Aboriginal nations who have completed declarations of independence. I think three of them have sent their stuff through to the United Nations in Geneva. We have, certainly. And I might add, when we talk about humanitarian crisis, our people, uh, my sister from uh, the Ngimba Nation was passionate yesterday and the day before about the fact that our people are dying in large numbers. We are incarcerated at extraordinary rates. Yeah. And so the question is why? Why are we dying at such a rate? Why is, are we, our kids being incarcerated at an enormous rate? And why have we got now more children being taken off their parents than we ever had in the history of this country? And so the forced removal of these children has to be addressed. So what, when we ask ourselves, what is the purpose of that? Why are they removing it? So when we look at all of these things that's going on, the deaths in custody, etc., we do have a humanitarian crisis in this country. And nobody has been isolating these things and looking at it, how it works, and what's really going on, and identifying, and, you know, there's some sisters who wanted to come down from Cairns. Unfortunately, there are people in this country in the last two days have had to deal with youth hanging themselves, committing suicide. Hanging is the preferred choice of killing themselves. And this is going on all over the country. And the youngest one who's hung themselves, I think, is 10-year-old. Right? And so the question is why? How do we address this? What are we going to do? And this is not going to be up to them whitefellas on the parliament house up there on the hill or a bureaucrat. This is up to our community leaders. And we need to support our community leadership to develop that because we need to work from the ground up. And so when you look at this, on the left-hand side are the males, and on the right-hand side are female. And so if you look at it, they're extraordinary. The, the death rate from 40s to 70s is extraordinary in the female sector. These statistics show to the public that we do have a humanitarian crisis in this nation. And we have to address it, and we have to address it fast before our people die. And we, we're losing a whole generation in, in this area here from 30s, from the 20s, right through to the mid 50s. We're losing a massive generation and we won't have the people fighting. This is the type of thing, the type of treatment, we saw this on the 60 minute program, of how they treat children, youth, Aboriginal youth in prisons. This is not an isolated incident, but it's one that struck terror right through this country and shamed this country. And so, as they say, um, Darwin Barrister John Lawrence, uh, Northern Territory Court, is often a time of Aboriginal defendants on a conveyor belt who are taken to jail to serve sentences or uh, for further remand, and so, at the end of, the mo of most of the days, benefit each courthouse, clearing house. The cells are full of Aboriginal cargo, ready to be driven down for racking and stacking into a $1.8 billion now overcrowded Darwin Correctional Precinct. This is just Northern Territory. This is just one place. If you really want to go and have a look at what they're doing in Western Australia, Margaret Prout now owns most of the female prisons in WA. She built them, they're private. And of course, they're full of Aboriginal women. It's, it's an extraordinary experience to, to get out there and have a look shocking. Right, so the United Nations Charter um, in San Francisco in 1945 said this, we the people of the United Nations determined to save the succeeding generations from the scourge of war 
which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights in the dignity and worth of the human person in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small and to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained and to promote social progress and better standards of life in the larger freedom. And ladies and gentlemen, we do have um, some ambassadors, people from different embassies here today. We have, um, um, if I may just ask you to, um, I'm, I'm asking them at this point in time because um, I really hope that we get these um, ladies and gentlemen to report back to their ambassadors, back to their embassies about what they hear today and hopefully we can enter into some dialogue because we need help. That's why we ask you to come. So if I may just ask you to introduce yourself and what embassy you come from, please. Okay. Good morning. Voilà. Uh, Fabien Grass, I'm the Charge d'Affaires of the Embassy of Switzerland. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, good morning. My name is Manuela Fernandez de Cordova. I'm the Charge d'Affaires of the Embassy of Ecuador. Thank you as well for inviting me. Tiene Embassy of Lithuania. Thank you for the invitation. Hello, good morning everyone. My name is Amaranta Leon. I'm in charge of affairs of the Embassy of Venezuela and thank you for the invitation. Hello, good morning to everyone. My name is Ilya Roshinkov. I am the second secretary of the Embassy of the Russian Federation and thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Now since 1992, these are all the countries that have been admitted to the United Nations. And so it shows, yeah, we, we probably would terrify the United, Na uh, United Nations with all our nations because we have over 300 independent language groups in this country. So if they made us all members independently of each other, we would control the United Nations. Yeah? So they would panic. But the thing is that we have a right. We do have a right to be recognized as independent peoples and independent nations, just like in the United States. The uniqueness about our position in Australia is the fact that we have never been defeated in a war by the British. We have never, ever ceded our sovereignty to these people, and we have never signed a treaty. And so that leaves us totally independent from all authorities. And that gives us, it puts us into a unique position in the world where we are now going to fight for the decolonization of our peoples and we want that independence as a people and how we work ourselves out from there to engage in the international arena is up to us and our people. And we'll talk more about that. So, the United Nations General Assembly Resolution 25 says the principles of equal rights and self-determination of peoples that describes that. I think we've got some paperwork there. The United Nations states can be small. Now, if we look at Nauru, my nation, the Ualii, we're, on, we're not that big in landmass, but we are bigger than Nauru. And here, Nauru is a Pacific island, and it has a permanent population of approximately 11,000 people, and they are members of the United Nations, that small nation. And by the way, Australia wrote their constitution and permitted them to become independent in that fashion. And so um, Australia knows about people becoming independent. And, and the good news is that one of the uh, British, former British col colonies, Barbados, has just been um, released from the ties of the British and are now independent nation. And so Prince Charles went over and sort of signed over on behalf of his mother, Queen of England, and gave them independence, and they are now a republic. This here, uh, this is a bit of a um, self-appraisal. No, nah, gammon. But anyway, it's so. What you see there on the on the far left is that was my home. I grew up in on the river bank on the Nemoy at Walgett, and of course a similar house where my auntie lived in Gaduga. We're on the river bank in a tin shack, no running water pretty hard carrying water from those old rivers and we, lived, we relied on the rivers because we had nothing else. 
That was the, the life and the spirit of our people that kept us alive, that, those rivers. And so from that place, in 1981, I was the first one to address the World Council, a world conference hosted by the United Nations in Geneva, and I was the first First Nations person to address the Assembly on Aboriginal issues in Australia. I'm honoured to know that um, that participation in 1981 put us right fair square, smack in the middle of the UN. And those people there who were with me from all over the world, from different parts of the world, we were engaged for five years to be advisors to the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council and the Third Committee to advise through this committee on First Nations laws and, and taking things through forward to become recognised and self-independent and look at how we can progress the uh, expansion of First Nations peoples into an independent nationhood and be able to work, either coexist or we take our own independence on our own way. So we're still working on that. Uh, that's some of the colleagues. In 1983, we went for an African, uh, Five Nation African tour. I was the research director for the treaty um, when Malcolm Fraser wanted to enter into a treaty uh, with Aboriginal people in this country. I was the uh, director of research and looking at all the international experiences and, and developing a framework for a national treaty in this country. That arrangement then, when we got down to almost getting ready to develop that framework, the National Aboriginal Conference, who were elected by our people, there were 36 of them, that was our black parliament in this country at the time, and so they decided that we should go to Africa. And the reason we went on that tour was because uh, India was about to host the Commonwealth um, heads of government, the nations. They were all to meet in, in Delhi. And so we jumped on a plane and we travelled to five key independent nations in Africa. And um, we didn't meet with pencil sharpeners. They reconvened the parliament in Nigeria for us to address the parliament. And the two Aboriginal delegates was Ozzie Cruz, Pastor Ozzie Cruz, and myself. And believe it or not, we took the former Prime Minister of Australia, Gough Whitlam, as our advisor, our diplomatic advisor. And so he volunteered to come. And that was one hell of a coup, let me tell you, because this man was a master um, of politics and a statesman. And he, he travelled with us um, right through Africa. And we ended up, <laughs> we ended up in Geneva, addressing the World Council of Churches. They paid us to go over there after we left Dar es Salaam. The, the two men here are significant men. The one on the right here is Robert Mugabe, President of Zimbabwe. Um, with us, we met with him. We met with him in Harare, in the President's Chambers, and we had discussions about Aboriginal development and Aboriginal advancement, and they wanted to know how they could work with us to assist us in decolonising, taking that next step, and get away from the tyranny and tyrannical control of the Australian government over our lives and dictating how we live. And this gentleman on, the, on, the, uh, on my right is a bloke called uh, Mulaman Narari, Narari of Tanzania, a great gentleman, a great statesman, and was the head of the African unity uh, movement for quite some time. And he was a brilliant man, and he hosted us at the presidential palace. And um, he really understood how to deal with the British and uh, gave us a lot of advice on how we should be approaching um, the process of decolonization so we can break away from England and start saying to the Australian government, we're here, you cannot ignore us anymore, and we're on your doorsteps, and we're not going anywhere, and so let's talk. And, but his advice, their advice, based on their experiences in decolonising their country and becoming independent was, don't waste your time talking with those colonialists in Australia because they don't have the power to make the decision that you want. I was invited back to the African Unity uh, meetings um, in Harare and Dar es Salaam one of the interesting things was that we were talking about the fact that these nations have become independent nations, but in the case of Zimbabwe, it was interesting because the conference I went to in 2007, they were talking about the fact that, well, look, we've gained our independence from England, but we don't own the land because these fellows are controlling our land and they're dictating to us how we should get these land because the, 
I went there and they were talking about the fact that they now gained independence, but all these white farmers, what they call through a process, uh, through a package of socage, these are soldier settlement grants. We call them in Australia soldier settlement grants. So the English relocated all their soldiers into these countries and gave them blocks of land for their services in the war. And so they squatted on these lands and they, they just turfed off the native populations in all these countries and they gave these farms um, to them. And so that war, even though they gained independence, they still didn't own the land. And Mugabe then set up a program where he wanted to pass a law to take the land off the white people. And of course, holy hell broke loose all over the world saying, you can't do that, you can't take the land off them, you can't pass a law, you have to pay these people. And so Mugabe negotiated with England and England gave him something like about $250 billion um, agreement under the Lancaster Agreement uh, to buy the land off these white farmers and send them home so they had money. But the interesting thing was the next conference in 2008 I went to, they then talked about economy. And what we talked about at that, at that meeting, um, this was in Harare in Zimbabwe, one of the things that we were talking about there was, okay, we got the land now but we don't own the money. The money is controlled from England. And so the African, and all the African nation countries, they were not dealing with their own money because they couldn't. No, nobody in the world would deal with their money because their money is not worth anything. And so they have to deal with gold bullion. And so they forced them into this situation, gold bullion and silver bullion. That was the only way they could do trade. And so we talked about this and how do we break it? This man came to the 2009 meeting, Mr. Gaddafi, and he came along, and one of the things he talked about at this meeting was about the fact that if you're, we're going to compete with the European nations, the Asian states, and, and America, and the English, if we're going to compete with them, we need to combine our efforts the same way they did with the European Union, and then create an African Dino. And so the idea was that these countries would pool their gold together and then create a gold-backed monetary system that would compete with any monetary system anywhere in the world. When that was about to get underway and they were planning, all of a sudden we had the Arab Spring uprising. And of course, I don't think we have to be scientists or political scientists or analysts to know what was going on here. And so they crushed him, they killed him, and they killed everyone else who was supporting that move. That was about the African. That, that the underground reality was they wanted to develop a gold-backed dollar that would, the Adina, that would compete with the rest of the world's currency and get power. So the sleeping giant in this world is Africa. They have not come together yet. They're on the move. Zimbabwe. So when we were talking about Zimbabwe, this fellow called John Howard, who was the Prime Minister of Australia at the time, had a, got really upset because he was saying, look, if you go down the road, if he's saying to London, if you allow Zimbabwe to take the land off these settlers uh, and these soldiers, settlements, by legislation in Parliament, and they don't have to pay them compensation, we're the next ones in Australia who's going to be targeted. And so John Howard was very concerned about that. And believe it or not, the person he got to do all the media campaigning and running in Europe was none, none other than our German friend, the Chancellor. And, and so they got him to do the campaigning in Europe against, against the English deal to remove these white people, white farmers, off country and give it back to black people in their own country. And so there became a great fight between England and Australia and Zimbabwe and Australia interfered big time in that, legal, in that process. 